town In the crowds gather round him like a king The smiling faces Join to see a branches waving They were masquerading in the air And my heart rose in my throat When I heard them sing Hosanna In the Good morning, Midland Free. We are so glad to have you join us this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, as we celebrate the greatest news that he has risen. Oh, some of you guys are ready. (laughs) 
Let's try that again. If you don't know, just shout out something. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, wow. You guys are quick learners. We are super excited to have you here with us. If you're a visitor, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you hope you, you enjoy our service, if you have questions following, we would love to talk with you. If you are in need of a Bible, I want to point out that we do have some Bibles. Feel free to get up in the back there. You can find them. There's some blue Bibles. If you don't have a Bible at all, take that one home with you. That's our gift to you. Also want to encourage you, if you call Midland Free your home, we have another way that we worship besides just showing up here or praying or doing other things throughout the week. And one of those is showing the generosity of God by being generous people. And we can do that through, through offering our, our time and our talents, but also the financial gifts that he has blessed us with. We want to use for the sake of his kingdom and the glory of his name being spread across the nations, both all the way to the edges of the world and even here. And so we have a bunch of ways you could do that. You can find that up there. You can text a dollar amount, use the app. We, we, we have also boxes that you can drop that off as well. Also want to encourage you that next Sunday, if, if you're new to church, we do this every week. You can come here next week and we'll be here again. And if you're brand new to our church, I want to invite you next Sunday following our service. We have a time of uh, meeting the pastors and getting to know some of us. If you have questions that you want to ask us or want to find out some things about the church, that's a great opportunity to do that. And so I want to invite you back. And there's usually some pretty awesome snack that you get to eat while you're hanging out talking with us. So with that, let's, let's pray as we continue our service. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you so much for what we are celebrating this day. There is an empty tomb because your son has been raised, not resuscitated back to ordinary life, but raised, glorified, exalted above all things, showing that by his life, by his death, by that glorious resurrection that we celebrate this day, that everything has changed. Life, abundant life can be found. Forgiveness and hope can be found. The very mercy of God can be received. And all of them find, find their way through him, Christ Jesus. What I ask that as we go through our service, as we sing, as we pray, as we read your scriptures, as we contemplate your word, I pray that you would be working already right now in the hearts and the minds of everyone here. And as we leave this day, we will have even more reason to rejoice because salvation has come and that the song of praise would echo in our life forever and ever to the glory and to the praise of our King and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We're super excited to worship with you on this Resurrection Sunday. Good to see all you smiling faces in a room full of people. He is risen. He is risen indeed. If uh, you're able, let's uh, stand and sing with joyful hearts this morning.
He himself bore our sins in his body on that tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. It's all I know on that final day I'll rise as Jesus rose On that day We will see you Shining brighter than the sun On that day We will know you As we lift our voice as one To that day We will praise you For your never so much for sending your son that Jesus chose to die for us he was never cornered but he chose Lord we thank you so much we just ask that you soften our heart this morning as we hear your word the truth we love you we praise you we thank you it's the powerful name of Jesus that we pray all these things amen before you sit down say hi to those around you happy Easter everyone
I know we've already done it a couple times, but I have it in my notes, so we have to do it again. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen indeed. That statement, that reality is at the very core of the Christian faith. If there is no resurrection, all that we do as Christians, all that we believe as followers of Christ, all that we hope in as having new identities in this risen reigning one is an utter waste of time. If there's no resurrection, we remain under the power and the authority of sin. We are still under the the righteous wrath of God that, that rightfully should be poured out upon sinful rebels. If there's no resurrection, Jesus is like any other man who died before him or like any other man who has died since. He's not Christ. He's not God. He's not Savior. He's just some overzealous religious leader who made bold promises, breathed his last breath on an execution cross, and became food for worms. But, very important, But if Jesus has been risen, his resurrection means something. If Jesus has been resurrected, he has accomplished something amazing. And surely if he has been resurrected, we should put our hope and trust in him. So we're going to spend this morning looking at that resurrection, but before we do, let's, let's pray. Father, I ask that you would be with us this morning as we come to your word, the word that you gave to your apostle Paul to be written down and conveyed to people. But I pray that we would see the glorious good news, the same news that the first recipients that received it went running to others to declare that the tomb is empty. Christ has been risen. I pray, Lord, that you would already be working. You would already be moving. You would already be reminding us of what this means and how the resurrection changes everything. And I ask, Lord, that you would refresh us in that if we already believe it. I pray that you would open our eyes to see it for the first time if we don't hold these things to be true. But above all, Lord, I ask that as we leave this morning, we would find joy and have more reason to celebrate than anybody else because salvation is found in the risen and reigning King. Pray this in his name, amen. If you have a Bible, I want you to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul, an apostle of of Jesus, writes this letter to this church in Corinth, which is in Greece. And there's, there's an issue here in this church because there are some people who are saying that, that there isn't a physical resurrection or that perhaps Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And so Paul writes these words, 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to start in verse 3. He says this, for I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. All right, what he's about to say is important here. So if you've never read this before or it's been a long time, tune in because what he is about to deliver is of first importance. What did he receive? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Those things were supposed to happen, Paul is saying. They were prophesied from the Old Testament. Shouldn't be a shock. Verse 5. That the risen Christ, that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. I do want to point out that's 500 brothers. That doesn't include the sisters. They were there, so there was more than 500 folks, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, meaning dead. 
then he appeared to James, and then to all of the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul is saying the thing of most importance, of of first importance, is that Jesus literally died. He was buried, laid in a tomb, but he raised again. This isn't some mythologized story because this risen Savior actually appeared to many people, Paul says, most of whom are alive. So if you think I'm mythologizing or or adding something to it, go ask them yourselves is what Paul is saying. What we're going to be looking at today is an actual event that really occurred Let me just clarify that. But before I continue, I want to address three groups of people who are probably here today. First, to the Christian. I hope that you will be encouraged this morning. I hope that as we go through this text, you will be encouraged, you'll be reminded of of a glorious truth that you can hold that will strengthen you as you continue to remind yourself and examine it and hold it and believe it and cling tight to it. To the skeptic who's maybe here to appease family members, but in the back of your mind, this is all foolish and stupid. I'm just here so that we don't fight over the meal. I want to point out to you that the author of these very words was a skeptic himself, a persecutor of the church. He actually sought to snuff out this movement in, in, in its infancy, but something happened. He saw something, it changed him, and then he's writing letters to the point that he will eventually be persecuted and give his own life for the sake of this message that he has risen. And so I pray if you are in that category, if you're that skeptic, I pray that God would be working to soften your heart. And to the third group is that person who thinks, I am unworthy, I am undeserving of forgiveness. Surely Jesus would have nothing for me. The grace of God is, is for other people, not me. I'm the sinner, I'm the dirty one, I am depraved. There is nothing he can do to, to wipe away the mess of my life. And I wanna point this out to you again. Take a look at verse nine. The person writing this was evil enough that at one point, He says, let me hold your coats so that you can better stone this Christian man as they stone Stephen, the first martyr. If God can forgive murderers, surely his grace is sufficient for you. If you're thinking, what about me? The reality is, is you probably fall into one of those three groups. And to all of us, I say, there is none outside of the saving grace of God. Wherever you are, whatever you have done, God's grace is sufficient for you. So why does Paul write to the Corinthians, this is of first importance, the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus, because the resurrection addresses core needs of every human being and addresses the desires that we all have. And I want to look a little bit further in this text. I've read verses three through nine, but I want to read a few more verses here. If you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, starting verse 12, we read these words. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith 
is futile and you are still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Church, if Christ is not raised, what do we have? If, if it's true that there's no resurrection, if it's true that Jesus is still dead, if it's true that he wasn't raised, what are we left with? This is a major issue. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 14, if Christ is not raised, then our preaching is in vain. If there's no resurrection, what's the point? If there's no resurrection, which Paul and, and others are preaching is, is the power and the hope of salvation, if that doesn't happen, my faith, your faith is in vain. He would write later on, just a few verses later in verse 17, that your faith is futile. If the Savior is still dead, he's not the Savior. Every Christian belief, every hope that we have hinges on the reality that Christ is resurrected. If Jesus has not raised, our faith is useless. It accomplishes nothing. We are just wasting our time this morning. He goes on and he says, it's not just that. Verse 17, he says, if Christ is not raised, we are found to be misrepresenting God. If the tomb is not empty, what do we have? Because we, right, the, the early church, myself included, we are preaching that the empty tomb is a sign that Jesus actually was approved by God the Father and so could take on our sins and not just take them on, but actually did something with them covering them with his righteousness. And you know that God accepted that sacrifice because he raised them from the dead. He wasn't a sinner. He was innocent. And he satisfied the debt due to us for our sins. But if the tomb is still full, our faith is pointless. And again, why are we here? He goes on and he says, if Christ has not been raised, verse 17, we're still in our sins. If we're still in our sins, we're dead. We have no hope. We still are going to experience that the burden and the weight and the guilt of the sins of our life. In verse 18, he says, those who have fallen asleep have perished if there's no resurrection because there's no life, there's no hope. We just eat, drink, and be merry because one day you'll be dead. That's it. It's done. What a pitiful state we find ourselves in if we are praising the name of one who is still dead. Because what has he accomplished? If there's no resurrection, we who believe in Christ are putting a foolish hope in fanciful dreams. We will be left just as disappointed, just as dead, just as separated from God as everybody else. But notice here how Paul is addressing the resurrection. He's using a, a, a proposition. He's saying, if, if, if there is no resurrection, if Christ has not been raised, if, if, if. But the reason we celebrate this day is because Christ has been raised physically from the grave. There's no if about it. This is why Paul says this is of first importance. The resurrected Jesus, the physical resurrected Jesus appeared to Peter and the 12 disciples, to, to more than 500 people. He appeared to James and to Paul himself. Why is this so important? Because those people interacted with a physical Jesus. The raised Jesus was not a spirit. He was touched he, he dined with many of his followers. This wasn't some sort of mass hallucination. 
That's not how it works. Perhaps you're familiar with an event that occurred in my home state a bunch of years ago. It's called Woodstock. It was the quickest thing that I went to mass hallucination. Because people were hallucinating there. Let's be honest, right? Maybe some of you were there. There's always people like, I was there. Were you really? Side point. <laughs> but if you're taking, you know, hallucinations, uh, uh, drugs that are making you to, to, to hallucinate, you're not seeing the same thing that the person who is hallucinating next to you is seeing. That's not how it works. Perhaps you see Jesus, but perhaps the person next to you is seeing something drastically different. You don't have more than 500 people having the same vision or the same hallucination at the same time. That's not how it works. The only thing that explains it is that they saw physical Christ standing before them. The early church could have proclaimed that Jesus was resurrected spiritually, but they don't do that. They go all in, and they say, no, it was him. Not a vision of him, not a ghost of him, not something that looked like him. It was him. Some can say, I stuck my hand in the holes. Others could say, I saw him prepare breakfast. And he ate with us. From the very beginning, the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus has been the hope of the church. Christians see Jesus as the first fruit, meaning others would follow after him and experience a physical, resurrected, glorified body that would give them a fullness of life and an and abundance that they've never experienced. They will actually be more alive because of the resurrection than they were before the resurrection. This is what Paul is pointing to in verses 21 and 22 when he says, for an Adam all die. Right? When, when Adam ate that fruit, all who are in him, that's all of humanity, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. In Adam, all sinned and inherited the consequence of sin, which is death. And that death is a physical death, but it's also a spiritual death. And then in Christ, the one who is often called the, the new Adam, the greater Adam, those who put their faith and hope in him receive resurrected life, and not just a physical life, but a spiritual life. We are made new through Jesus' death and resurrection. He redeems us completely. Why do we celebrate the resurrection of a physical Christ? Because if you want your body to be healed, it needs to be redeemed. If you want your, your emotions or, or your mental state to be healed and, and renewed, it needs to be redeemed. And so we have one who is fully God, who comes in the flesh and is so fully man. So when he dies, he's not just redeeming your soul, he's redeeming your entire being. That's good news. He's redeemed us for a purpose. He is risen. Therefore, everything is different. I want to walk through these, these verses again, but I want you to look at them differently. Let's look at these five realities for you if you're a Christian since Christ has been raised. I want to look at it no longer as if, but since, since Christ has been raised, our sin is forgiven. Since he has been raised, our sin is forgiven. In verse 17, Paul writes, if Christ had not been raised, we would still be in our sin. But since he has been raised, those who place their faith in him are freed and pardoned from sin. If you joined us on, on our Good Friday service, one of the things we did was just kind of symbolically showed that we, we took some time, we, we wrote down our sins or, or sin we're struggling with or an idol that we're pursuing and we, we literally were nailing it to a piece of wood symbolically showing that I'm gonna lay this down because I believe that Christ 
actually did something when he died and that God actually accepted it when he was resurrected. This is why when the first song was here, I don't know if you noticed that, I thought it was pretty cool that the cross went from red to white when Joe started saying he had risen. Because it means that the the blood of Christ was sufficient to cover over your sin no matter what it was. And then when God looks upon you, if you put your faith and hope in Christ and Christ alone, he doesn't say sinner, he says, my beloved. That's awesome. Because I don't know about you, but there are times I forget that Christ is risen, and I start looking at myself, and I say, surely God cannot love me. And then I look to a tomb and I see that it is empty and I know that God has risen my Savior and he has counted his work as done, finished, approved, and satisfying the wrath against the sin that I have committed. This is why we celebrate. If you're not a Christian, this reality isn't true for you yet. Paul would write in Romans chapter four, Jesus was delivered for our trespasses and raised up for our justification. Those who repent, those who believe in Christ are acquitted. They are counted not guilty, not because you're innocent, but because he was innocent. Because he substituted himself in your place. That's not true if you're not a believer, But that doesn't have to stay that way. Today could be the day that everything changes for you. Forgiveness is not the end point of salvation. It's merely just the entrance into the grace of God. But I think some of the reason Paul starts here is because forgiveness in a way is like a key to a mansion. Right? If, if, if you're forgiven, you're given a glorious inheritance, like this mansion, right? I have this picture up here. Like, imagine you have this key, you're, you're forgiven, you walk into the foyer, you have, I mean, this, these, these pretty cool stairways going up there, there's, there's stuff in the back, but forgiveness is basically saying, if you stop at forgiveness, you've said, I'm pretty cool with the, the foyer. I don't know what's upstairs, but I'm never going to go up there. I don't know what's the door to the right or the left. I, I, there's a pool back there, I'm never going to see it. I'm good with forgiveness. If that's you, I want to encourage you. You are missing out on the depths and the glory of the grace of God. Please don't see as forgiveness as the end of salvation. It is merely just the doorway into a glorious inheritance. The apostle continues on. Since Christ has been raised, church, our faith is trustworthy and precious. Your faith in Christ is trustworthy. It's precious. The resurrection reveals that Jesus' words are true. He said he was going to be martyred. He said he was going to be turned over to the authorities. He said he was going to be killed. He also said he was going to be raised three days later. All of these things that he said have come true. So surely they are trustworthy. They should be precious. They should be things that we we store up and that we hold and we, we hold them dear. This faith is also precious because it shows that everything he said is true and that our hope is not in vain. It's it's not futile. It's it's got reason. It's got a risen and reigning one who has promised to never leave us or forsake us. That's precious. It's something we need to hold on to. The resurrection affirms that God has the ability to conquer every enemy you might face. The resurrection reminds us that God loves us and is faithful towards us. That's precious. That's something we should cling to. Church, since Christ has been raised, What we proclaim of God is true. Since Christ has been raised, what we proclaim is true. Paul writes in verse 14 that if Jesus is not raised, that he and others, again, I include myself, misrepresent God. 
if he is dead, I'm a liar. And I'm not just a liar about Christ. I'm a liar about Yahweh, God. Because I'm teaching you, just like Paul and others, I'm trying to plead with you, if you want to be right with God, the only way you can do it is through Christ. And the only reason you can trust in Christ is because he took on your sins in your, in your place. The only reason you could trust in him is because the grave is empty. The only reason you could trust, the only hope we have, the only, right, I keep pointing to Jesus, to Jesus, to Jesus, to Jesus. But if Jesus is dead, I am lying about God because I am saying that's God's way to redeem you. But if Jesus is dead, that means either God has another way and I am distracting you from it and, and leading you astray or I'm misrepresenting God because he has decided to wash his hands of humanity and say, let them all just die. But if Christ has been raised... What we proclaim is true. And it's a truth that changes everything. The fourth reality of the resurrection is that since Christ has been raised, we are to be envied. Paul writes that if he's not raised, we're to be pitied. But Jesus has conquered sin. Jesus has risen victorious over death. He has lifted the burden and condemnation we experience because of sin. That's not something to be pitied. That's something that the people want. Since he has been raised, we have freedom and strength to fight sin. I don't pity that. I envy that. Since he is raised, we have hope even in the most dire of life circumstances. That's not to be pitied. That's to be envied. Since he has risen, we can trust that God is for us, working in us, and that he wants what's best for us. He hasn't left us. He hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't cast us out forever and ever to be damned for all eternity. But instead, in love and kindness, he came and redeemed us back to himself. Through the resurrection of Christ, we get God. Why would you pity me? You should be envious because we have the greatest glory and good gift ever to be given. We have the treasure of God himself looking and delighting upon us and then we can enter into his presence and delight in him forever and ever. Don't pity me. I pray for you. And finally, we come to this reality. Since Christ has been risen, those who die in Christ shall never die. I mean, that's another reason not to pity us. If Christ has been raised, those who die in Christ shall never die. The reality is, is one of the most frequent questions that, that humanity gives whether you're a young child or a teenager or a, a, a young adult, a middle-aged person, even a senior, is what happens when we die? What's, what's there? There's, there's this fear in that question. I don't know what's around the corner when I finally breathe my last breath. I think there's this innate fear in us that, that we don't want to die. There's something wrong with death. Right? As a pastor, one of my jobs is I do funerals. And every funeral, I mean, even funerals that I've done for non-believers, someone says, this just isn't right. Death isn't right. It just doesn't make sense. It, it should be, there should be something more. There's this fear. We fear oblivion. Is all of this pointless? Is the pain and suffering just... A reality we suffer and it there's no reason to it I don't have time to dive fully into this but but I would encourage you take some time to check out first Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 5 because the Apostle Peter there says through the resurrection of Jesus 
God has caused us to be born again to a living hope and to a glorious resurrection. It's Peter's way of almost saying what Paul writes here in verses 20 when he says, but if, excuse me, verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep, he doesn't mean take, took a nap. He's talking about people who've died. And then in verse 22, kind of the second half of it, he says, in Christ shall all be made alive. Because of the resurrection, there's hope that when this life is through, you don't fade into oblivion. Because of the resurrection, the sting of death is removed. There is a drastic difference if you go to a funeral of the atheist or the non-believer, compare that to the funeral of the believer. I mean, there's sorrow and there's mourning, right? We, no, both cases, right? Like, we're humans. Whether you're a believer or not a believer, it, your heart breaks when people die. But there's hope for the Christian. Because they know they serve a risen, living God who can take our mortal flesh and breathe better life into it than we ever experienced here on earth. Paul writes in his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter five, verse four, these glorious words. He says, for while we are still in this tent, right? He, he's talking about the body, he, right? He's using analogy. Your body's like a tent, right? Your, your soul and spirit is it's housed in, a, in, in this tent. We groan and, and being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, right? Not that... that Humanity, not that the physical flesh would somehow disappear, but rather that we would be further clothed. What are you talking about there, Paul? So that what is mortal would be swallowed up in life. What Paul is saying is, The hope of the Christian isn't that we are some sort of spiritual beings floating around in all eternity. The hope of the Christian is that you will be given a better body, a better physical body, one that's glorified, one like the risen Christ was given when he was raised from the dead. We are going to be spirits floating around. Please, please, if you don't remember anything else, remember that for a moment. The fact that you're human isn't evil. It's the sin that we do. And the promise we have in a resurrection is that you will be made new. You will be more human than you ever were. And those who have put their faith and hope in Christ will not have to wrestle with sin inside themselves anymore because that part of your life has been redeemed by the risen Christ. And so you enter into a new and glorious life that you will live forever and ever within the presence of God. It can be yours. It is yours only through Christ. The greatest news in all the universe is that Jesus raised from the dead that he was victorious, that he trampled over sin and death, that he satisfied the wrath of God and so reconciled us back to God. How do I know that? Because he is risen. Through Jesus' resurrection, the curse of sin and death is broken. Through Jesus' resurrection, we who are dead can find true life in him. Because of his resurrection, those who have placed their faith in him will never experience the full sting of death, but instead will enter into their joy, rejoicing in the name of the risen king. Through Jesus, life is found because he is the life. I pray that this resurrection Sunday, you will rest in these five realities. They're yours or they can be yours if you trust in no one else but the risen and reigning Jesus. Let's pray.
Lord, help us. Help us to see the good news that the tomb is empty. Help us to see that that the resurrection points to so many of these glorious realities. There is an innate desire in our heart that wants to live. And life is found in him. We want there to be more than just the pain and suffering of this world. And in the resurrection, we find that there is hope amidst this pain in this world, but also a glorious hope that is ours that far exceeds even this world. But God, I pray that we would rest in the glorious news that's of first importance that Jesus didn't just die for our sins, but rose victorious. May we celebrate that. Lord, I pray that you would use my foolish words to pierce the hearts of those who are wondering, who are pondering, who are are angry, who are confused, that they would see that you met them in their mess so that you could redeem them. And that by the finished work of Christ, we too can experience not just life, but life with you. And that they would enter into the joy and find the pleasures that are found only at your right hand, which we have access to because he is risen. He is risen, he is risen, and he reigns, and he is finished with his work, and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing in response.
want to encourage you that if, if, if you want someone to talk to, if you want someone to pray with, if, if you're dealing with something, you're wrestling with something, or maybe you're one of those people like, hey, I got some questions. I want to encourage you, after we dismiss you, feel free to come forward. Our, our pastors, some of our, our care team, some of the elders will be here to pray with you, to talk to you, to, uh, to help you walk through some of these things. If you want to know more about what is this hope of the risen king Come talk to us. Um, I, I would ask for this section here, you guys over here, if you could help us by, uh, when you leave, stacking those chairs. We'd appreciate that as we get ready for the other activities and things that we have uh, throughout the week. Um, let me send you out with these words. From a little further down in 1 Corinthians 15, when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We know we have this victory because he is risen. Have a blessed week, church.